Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Group. So tonight, uh, it's a special edition of Shop Talk, sort of like the, the episodes of 1990s television shows where they would have the special, the very special episode. So uh, Mike is going to be on drugs, and we're going to have to talk him out of it. But over the course of 30 minutes, we're going to do it, and then we'll never call, uh, call back to that episode again. Anyhow, welcome to Shop Talk. We have a full crowd here tonight. All the squares are filled. Uh, the square over this way, we've got Mala. How you doing, Mala? Hello, everyone. Nice to be back. It is good to have you back, Mala. Uh, going diagonally down this way, we have Mike Christensen. Mike, how are things? Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Mike, stop doing drugs. <laughs> don't worry we've, we've still got uh 29 minutes to talk him out of out of his self-destructive habits and special guest star down in this square right here we have bart Fer fernayan um although i tried to roll the r this time i did it slightly better pre-stream so Fer fernayan sorry the, the r is not rolling now that we're on the air that's what happens i have you are doing time. good <laughs> but Anyhow, Bart, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So um, I am Bart Vernayen, which is with the R rolling now. Uh, I've been working with SQL Server for about uh, 20 years, and my main focus goes to automating all administrative tasks with PowerShell. And I'm also into uh, performance tuning. So that's the reason why I'm here tonight, because I have written some code that I would like to present to you guys. It is all written in PowerShell, and it is performance related. Excellent. And we're happy to see that. Um, I'll give you, I'll vamp while you sh set up the screen sharing, which is something we should have done pre-stream. But that's okay. This is a very professional show, Shop Talk is. By the way, Shop Talk, as always, this is a chat hosted or chat chat driven program where if you have questions, you have thoughts, drop them in chat. It's easy to derail me. It may be easy to derail Bart. We're going to find that out tonight. But if you do have questions as we go along, uh, check that out. We also have a few other topics that we're going to talk about after this, including one that I'm pretty excited about. This sounds awfully serious for Shop Talk, Andrew says. It is. It is. Um, but we are going to do our best to try to get Mike to go clean. Let's see. Um, so, Mike, what would the drug of choice be? This is this is obviously like late 80s, early 90s. So, however, it can't be anything serious enough that the sensors wouldn't let us get it on the program. So I think it's going to be something like stimulants. You're, you're popping all those stimulant tabs to keep you awake during studies. Yeah. So that's 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 it. I, I yeah. Uh, get a twenty one jump street. It. Pretty much. How's the screen sharing process going, Bart? Are you getting it all oh, sorted out? I was waiting for you guys, oh. but I can start to. No, go for it. Uh, go for it. We'll. <laughs> We'll vamp in the meantime until you get Yeah, you put on our goofy jokes. Yeah, it'll be a while. So I have to be sure that I'm streaming the entire screen. Okay. That's interesting. Got a new sign here. Yes. Should be seeing the first part. So maybe I can start by explaining how I came to creating my first piece of code. So the first, I had a database where I had one table where I had way too many indexes and I could get rid of some of them, but still then I had too much and all of those indexes had uh, too many columns in them. And I couldn't find any software or any tool or anything that could help me to tell me up to column level, which column is used in an index, how it was used, or if it isn't used at all. So. Then I started on this quest and it, yeah, it has taken me some time, but I've managed to, to, to build a tool that does exactly what I said before. So for this, 
I am using the query store, so, so you should have query store enabled on the database to be able to use this one. Um, and I have a SQL script, which is far from perfect, but I'm using this at this moment. So here I have a database, the Stack Overflow database that I have prepared with the queries that are running for the rentals are mastering index tuning class. So that workload has been run on that database. From there, I will extract some information. So the query store information, uh, and further on also some information about indexes in, in the Stack Overflow database, the columns that are in there, tables, schemas, and so on. You will see here that I am also um, collecting some statistic information. And at the end, we will make a backup of that database and drop it in. So I will do this right now. So if we go over here, we can see that a database has been created. So the way I'm doing it this way, because I want to get away from my client database as much as possible. I don't want to have any interference with my client database. So now that I have a backup file, I can, I can take it anywhere, restore it, and do the analysis at another place. So now we have this. First part is I'm going to restore the database that I've just created. So while you're restoring that, would it be okay to bump up the font size just a little bit? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I should have presenter mode on. In... Yeah, SSMS was better? fine. It was the PowerShell once you got into VS Code that was a little bit. Um, okay, but I won't be doing be doing much in here anyway. Okay. So okay, fair enough. So you see that we have restored the database. If we now go back, to our SQL server, we have an extract database. And that database contains the information that we have just gathered from um, our Stack Overflow database. You also see some empty columns, and we are going to fill those now. So we are going to process the query plans that are extracted from Stack Overflow database. And as you can see, that this, this has been done quite uh, uh, quite rapidly. So what I have done now is for every query that was in the query store, I have been searching for all the index related operation, operations. So you can see that for this query hash, this was an insert. Uh, you can see on which index that the insert has been done. Um, Table name, comments. Uh, if we go more to the bottom here, we can see that this was an update statement. Here we can see up to column level what column has been changed in this index. So we have this index over here. We can see that last access date has been updated as well in this index. Um, and I also uh, look for query hints. So if there was a uh, an index hint for this query, then we will know. And later on, we will not drop this index because it's been referenced by the query hint. The third part then is to maybe one more thing that I can show you uh, over here. So for all the indexes that we have in our table, I also can tell you how many reads have been done, how many inserts are in, uh, have been done in that table, and so on. So same here for updates. And in this workload, this specific work, workload, there were no deletes. 
So then the third part is used to evaluate the information that just was parsed from the query plans. And it will also create us a index chain script. So we can see for this uh, workload that we have some indexes without reads and writes, and we could consider to drop these. For each um, index that will be dropped, I have also created an undo script. Here we have also some indexes with writes but no reads. Those are the indexes that I would definitely get rid of. And then, this is the most fun part. Is is it okay if I take this a little bit smaller? Yeah, not a problem. That yeah, that works fine. Okay. Um, just like this. So we can see that originally we had a index, this one, which corresponds with the top one over here, on user ID creation date and post ID. We could see that there were no filter operations on post ID, so we were able to move this one to the includes instead of to the key columns. For the second one, we had an index on, on the user ID, post type ID, ID, and accepted answer ID. And we finished up with a query on owner user ID, post type ID, removed ID to the includes, and accepted answer ID was uh, removed because it wasn't used. Then for the last part, um, I'm going to craft some indexes based upon uh, so we have from the query store information, we have uh, the top resource using queries by CPU, by duration, and logical reads. And in those query plans, I'm going to look if there are any missing index requests. Then on those missing index requests, I use a whole lot of um, code as well. Amongst others, I use statistics to see which columns can be selective, if some columns are nullable or not. And then I use this to create um, some extra indexes. I can show you with this demo, but I do understand that this was a demo from the master index tuning class from Brent Ozar that was crafted to have some nice results. So I had some nice results. I've started with this workload the first time without any changes, took five hours and 40 minutes. After one run of my code, I got it down to 26 minutes. Then we went to 19, this, no. Then we went to 19 minutes, and the fourth time or the third time running the code, I got it down to 17 minutes. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a nice result. If you have a database that is really well maintained and has really nice indexes on them, I won't be able to make much of a difference with my tool. But what I can do is I can go to up to column level for every index on every table in your database. Hmm. So um, one question I've got along these lines is, uh, classically when we're looking at things like missing index requests, in SQL Server, the column ordering isn't necessarily the best order for how you should lay that index out. Uh, do you yeah. look at all at at column ordering in the indexes and see if? Uh, yes. So I do know where we have equality searches. I do know. I do look at statistics. I do try to combine different missing index requests and then try to craft one 
index requests from that. So it's not just the order, the alphabetical order that that is in the missing index request that is uh, copy copy paste into these various results. I thought that was pretty smart. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because that's definitely something that uh, you can find a lot when you go on consulting engagements, and particularly with not not so sophisticated uh, administrators, just accepting. Oh, okay. Well, it, SQL Server said this index would be a good idea, and then you see, wait a minute, that order is not right at all. No, I'm not saying that this is a perfect tool and that there isn't any room for. Uh improvement but i had some nice results with it yeah it looks that way and then maybe or if you have any more questions i'm happy to answer them sure uh no questions from me at the moment chat if you've got questions right now get them in and then i'll ask them just like it's normal <laughs> Okay, up to the next one. <laughs> Anders says just use the DTA in indexes. This is why Anders isn't on the program. <laughs> yeah, but this allows you to, to actually parse the whole query store mm. and all the query plans that are in there. And if you have to do this manually, it's very, very hard to know what is used and what isn't used. Right, right. And it's always a nightmare when you go in and you see underscore DTA underscore on dozens of indexes across every table and you start to ask, okay, now which two of these are actually relevant? Yeah, it looks like uh, no questions at the moment. Okay. Then I'll continue to the second one if that's okay. Of course. So I gave this demo to uh, quite some people at Pass Summit last year. And one of those people was uh, Ben Miller, DBA duck. He's, I think he's well known in, in the States. And he liked this as well. And he said, there's one more thing that I would like to see, the difference between actuals and estimates. And I told him, if you use the query store, there's no way to tell this because query store has estimated plans. And if you want to compare actuals versus estimates, you do need real um, the actual plans. So then I started the second thing. And what I then did is I had the same uh, workload running, but I made a lightweight um, extended events trace file to capture the actual plans. You should be able to see this here, hopefully, if I haven't removed it. Uh... So just let me have a look if I can make this more clear. Seems to be difficult. So but this is the query post execution plan. And there you have some actual information about the query plans. Not everything is there. I think memory grand uh, weight statistics aren't included and some other stuff, but most of the relevant information can be found over there. So I've run this extended event files and have captured a extended event file. So the second piece of code, I'm going to start with uh, creating a database, in this case, 
the name of the database is uh, plan usage. There we have some tables created. And if we'll look at this, this is empty at the moment. So the second part of my code, I will import the extended event file. So if you now go back over here, you can see that we have uh, 3,220 plants imported. And then I'm going to parse those as well. So all this is running. In the actual plan, you can see, so this is the name of the event that was captured, the timestamp of when it was done. Uh, you have some memory information, some CPU information. Here you can see that we have the actual plan as well. Yeah, and some, and I've given either, every plan, I have given a separate ID. In the meantime, our script is finished. And so what I have done then, then I go to the node information. So for every plan, you can see that for every node in the query plan, we are going to gather the estimated information. So we have the estimated CPU time, subtree cost, and so on. You also can see what the physical and logical operators are, and if a operator has run in parallel or not. To see the actual numbers, we have to go to thread level in our nodes. So this is parsed as well. Uh, so you can see we have our same plan ID over here at the, at the left. And if we scroll to the right, you can see that for plan ID number one and node ID number two, we have several columns because this was run multi-threaded. So we have information for all the threads that were in the query in that specific node. So we have information memory usage information. And these are now all the actual columns that could have been filled in, but it doesn't mean for every operator and every plan that all those columns will be filled in. So if there isn't information in the query plan, we will see no values. Then another thing that is captured are the parameters. So we have, once again, our plans. We see which parameter was added to that uh, plan, what the compiled value was, and the runtime value. If you continue, we have some information in general, some general information on the query plan, so we can see our degree of parallelism. Uh, compile time, CPU time, compile memory, and so on. This is other information uh, about estimates of rows, cardinalities, and so on and so on. We have information about the CPU time, elapsed time, which statistics were used, and also if there were warnings, we have some information. So this is the basic info, and at this moment, I am uh, creating some views on that database to give me more insight in what is going on, actually. So I have a view for this um, regarding my um, warning. So in this load, we can see that we have 70 short spills, six hash spills, and 284 uh, memory grants warnings. So if you look 
at the hash fill, I have information how much memory was granted, how much is used, how many writes we had to the 10 dB. We can go directly directly to the plan if we want to and see some information over there. Uh, in this load, there weren't any compile time modes, but if there are, we can see that information as well. Then this is a view where I can compare the params and, and see what the elapsed time and CPU time was. So we can see here that we have, this is one query hash. And we can see that this goes from, let's say two seconds to almost or six milliseconds. So we can easily compare and see what the influence of a parameter on a query plan is. And this is actually the question from Ben Miller. Show me estimates versus actuals. So you can see for this plan and this uh, node ID that we had one row returned, but we had actually uh, 11 estimated, which isn't a big deal, but I, I took a percentage. We can see it the other way around as well. So here we had actually, I think it's 2 million, 24 million rows, where we estimated that we had only uh, 50 rows returned. So this would be uh, a concern of mine. Um, then I also made a view to see for a query hash how many different plans were created. So maybe we could have parameterized this query to have uh, less plans in the cache. Uh, yeah, and so at this moment, this is about it. So, but this is still work in progress. So there is a whole lot of information in the tables. And now I have to put everything together to get some useful data out of it. Right. I mean, I'd say even right now, there's, there's a lot of useful information that uh, we can see in here. Just, just knowing here are radical differences between estimations and actuals and yeah. Uh, some of that information, even um, compilation timeouts, which are notoriously difficult to track down because yeah. not a lot of places store that information. Yeah, I have used it. And I can tell you one case where I used it, where I could immediately say that my statistics were out of date and updating statistics um, solve my problem. Then I had another case where I had a left join where actual versus estimates were completely off and I could replace that left join with the where it exists, which solved my problem. So yeah, I've used it and I find it useful and I keep on adding views to, to, to make this better and more useful. So it's fun for me. Sure, uh, and pretty useful. So chat, if you have any, any questions or any thoughts about what would you like to see? Just to make sure th that the rows were actually filled, so they were empty, so <laughs> the parsing has happened. This is no, there are no tricks up on my sleeve or anything <laughs> like that, so. Right. So today, it uh, looks like there's warnings. Are those uh, the warning indicators that you would see in execution plans, like um, spill to disk or implicit conversion? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, here. I see. So those are that's where you get the different views of plan warnings and. Yeah. So here I made an overview of. Yeah. To, to let us show which were the actual warnings that occurred mm. in this workload. So we have 76 spills to 10 dB. 
You have 70 of those were short spills, six were hash right. spills. If you would like to know more information about your short spills, okay. These are your short spills. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And Anders is asking the big question uh, that is, so where can we get it? Which I'll rephrase to, I know that you're you're thinking about possible uh, plans. And if you wanted to talk a little bit about what you're thinking of, of future plans. Well, I am thinking, I, I don't know. Um, I have put a lot of effort in this. I have worked a long time on this. This isn't something that, that was uh, created in overnight. So am I going to try to make this into a product? Am I going to open source it and, and try to make some services around it? And Or am I just going to open source it and leave it into the wild? I'm not sure yet. I'm still, and that's why, and I would like to thank you for this op opportunity, that I would like to get some feedback from people to to get to know if this is something that they consider to be useful. And if, yeah, any and all feedback would be welcomed. If I'm going to open source one of those, it will probably be in short term the second one. So the one that I demoed the last. Hmm. So this one. Right. So uh, what would be the best way for people to reach out and contact you if they do have feedback? Um, I would suggest email because I'm terrible at uh, social media. The only thing where you will actually find me is on LinkedIn. So maybe I can paste a link in the chat over here to my LinkedIn file or they can email me. I will put my email address in the chat as well, if that's okay for you guys. Certainly. Bart, have you ever done a user group presentation on this, like uh, with the slide deck and a... Actually, no. no, that would be, that would reach a lot of people. No, I haven't. So I've went to PASS last year and I demoed this to a lot of the big name consultants. Um, I had some nice feedback of them. They didn't actually use it. Um, and I did the same now at, at SQL Bits and yeah, people like it, but I haven't actually used it. So no. Having a, having a UG presentation uh, would help um, along with whatever you said you want to give out for free. Um, that might be helpful for people to see and uh, know more about. Yeah, I do understand. Yeah, and like uh, Andrew says here. I will have to make a decision. So anywhere between now and a month, I will decide to what I will do with it because I can't sit on it forever. So yeah, well, that's fair. It's it's a big decision to make. And like Andrew says, anything I can use to help me find indexes, I'm all for it. Uh, completely agreed there. That It's a very common request. It's very easy to get it wrong. Um, and anything that makes that job easier for people seems like it's a winner. Yeah. All right. And I... Uh, found your LinkedIn, so I'll drop a link to it for anybody who's interested in following up with you afterward. Okay. Turns out that there is another Bart Fernayen, uh, who is also in Belgium, but is a totally different person. Yes. So. Probably much prettier than I am. <laughs> he did have more hair, but, you know, we're not going to judge that too much. <laughs> I used to have a lot as well, but... <laughs> But as your brain expanded, it just you needed some place to, to store all the extra brain. It makes sense. That's it. <laughs> so we certainly appreciate the time. If anybody has any uh, follow up, check out LinkedIn. Uh, drop the link in chat here so you can go forth, ask additional questions. We'll be interested to see 
uh, how this shapes up over time and you know if it does become a marketable product then where we'd be able to get it if it's open source we'll make sure to share that information as well um, Andrews does mention you know, especially if I can compare tables across multiple databases and I understand exactly that scenario um, looking at something like a, a sharded data structure where we've they've got a lot of copies of the same schema but different databases and different customers in each database where yeah. the same indexes don't necessarily make perfect sense across different customers based on access patterns. Um, that can be a real yeah. challenge as well. Yeah, exactly. So well, one word of advice for the uh, second tool, if you are going to use that extended event, please do filter on one or database and even further maybe because although it is said to be light, it will cause some over overload on your server. So be careful with it. Uh, that is good advice when, when dealing with some of the heavier extended events, uh, especially yeah. things that, that involve query plans because the plan XML can get kind of big. Yeah. You know, even, even so, seeing what you had, yeah. which didn't seem like it was a whole lot of events, but it was still 35 megs worth. Yeah, but I've tested my code on five files of one gigabyte, so five gigabyte of data, hmm. and I was able able to 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 parse them in fifteen to twenty minutes. So, if you can parse that many query plans in fifteen to twenty minutes and get the information like this, it's it's helpful. Absolutely, yeah. Um, that's quite a few plans to, to shred and yeah. uh, doing that within half an hour. That's, that's just lunch. Yeah, it is. All right. Thank you again so much. And again, if anybody has any questions, please do feel free to follow up, follow up with Bart. Uh, LinkedIn is link is in the chat. Bart, we appreciate you stopping in. It's 1130 something PM your time. So certainly uh, appreciate you taking some time on a Monday evening, Monday night to talk about this. Uh, we're excited to see where it goes in the future. And I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to keep in touch and you know, give, give oh, yeah. people an idea. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh, we have somebody who wants to do to accept them into your LinkedIn network. So you're, you're going to have some contacts after this. Great. I'm looking forward. Thank you very much. All right. Of course. And now I will stop my screen share now and sure. give it back to you guys. Excellent. Thank you, Bart. Yeah. Thank you. Now for thank you, something mildly different. Um, so a couple of interesting things came out of SQL bits. And the most interesting thing, I'm just going to declare it up front. Um, I have to share my screen in order to show it. And that is regular expressions in SQL database. So this is something that I have been agitating for for a very long time. And I did see Solomon in chat earlier, and I promise I will talk about SQL Sharp. Um, but regular expression support. Oh, you actually like it, Kevin? What? You like it? You like it and you want it? Regular expression support? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I am all yours. All right. Go on, <laughs> all right. So this blog post came out from Abhiman Tiwari, uh, published just a couple of days ago. Uh, I believe that was, that would be Friday morning. And talked about a private preview of regular expression support in Azure SQL database. So Azure SQL database only, invite only right now. You know, we expect private preview to public preview to general availability. Um, Anders says hard no. Uh oh. But Anders also says yes to cursors. So listen, Anders. Um, I will. I will give my caveat. I will give a caveat. I promise. But the idea here is that there are a few different options and it follows the I do like F sharp. Yes, Anders, I do like F sharp. This is why 
smart people agree that uh, whoops, smart people agree that I probably should grab the right thing and move it over. My entire judgment is questionable. Have you been talking to my wife again? Um, so let's talk about what's available in regular expressions in Azure SQL database in private preview. So Anders can't get it. Um, there are a few different functions that are available like uh, like function count, in string search, replacement, substring search. So the regular, regular expression like is just a true false. Very quick, do, does this pattern exist? So one example that it, we have in the, sh um, the blog post here, regular expression is like an email pattern, which really could be a little bit simpler than this. I hate this idea more than I hate git. That's a that's a lot of hatred. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna announce mercurial support, Anders. That will that will help. Uh, so, regular expression pattern matching on check constraints, which I think is nice, uh, very valuable, because this gives us a data quality constraint. I implemented Git and SQL in SQL 2005. I mean regex. Well, yeah, you can do regex in CLR, um, which I'll talk about. Yeah, I mean, that's a Solomon thing for sure. Yeah, I will talk about yeah. that with Solomon. Mm -hmm. So check constraints, supporting regular expressions, I think is quite useful. Filter searches on regular expressions. Again, this is an area where I understand this is not going to be something you want to do for every query. This is something that can be a uh, possible terrible performance idea because if if you look at this particular regular expression it's saying hey we're email ends in dot com well depending on how your index is laid out maybe you can come up with a, a way of making this not awful but yeah for the most part this is probably not gonna not gonna work very well for performance but it's also not the type of thing that you would want to run on enormous transactional tables. Uh, this would be more of, I'm doing analysis. I'm doing a more descriptive pattern search. I'm looking for styles, looking for uh, incorrect layouts. I, I assume that the data is shaped this way. I am going to want to ensure that the data is shaped this way and find any stragglers that are not shaped that way because I would actually like to implement some data quality rule. So those are some of the general use cases. You can also find the number of times that you get a pattern matching in a string. And in this case, uh, this is probably a less common occurrence that you would see in regular expression util utilization looking for expressions that are in string in the middle of a string. Again, performance is going to suffer on this. You will have a scan, but deal with it. Um, you have scans, you have scans on other things. There's no way to do this today without a scan. This isn't going to prevent a scan, but it'll give you a clearer way. Cosmos is that way. Get out of my chat, Anderson. You're still scanning a Cosmos. <laughs> Uh, you would still scan in Cosmos in that scenario and also pay more money. But I'm not here to bag on Cosmos. That's ne that's next episode of Shop Talk. Replacements. You can perform in uh, replacements of patterns, including, I should point out, that there are capture groups and capture group patterns that are available within the regular expression call, which I like a lot because I am... Uh, th th I think that's one of the better use cases for regular expressions is in data quality. It's in finding uh, missing mismatched patterns, finding incorrect setups, and then fixing that. And substrings, searching for substrings within a regular, uh, within a, a column and a table. So devs can barely write a good query, and now you want to let them write a regular expression in a query that they can barely write. Yes. Next question. Um, so, yeah, okay, developers, 
have trouble writing queries sometimes. That's absolutely true. But at the same time, there are capabilities that you're going to miss out on, including as an administrator, in terms of fixing that bad data in the database. How, how else do you search for and find, do you actually fit a specific pattern because nobody put a check constraint on that column that is supposed to be for telephone numbers and how do you know that the pattern is in a telephone number i mean what are you going to do export it all to excel and then search in excel hire hire interns to search through the data um or are you going to write some combination of nastiness involving uh pat index and char index and substrings and like statements you know there's uh, there's not a good way to do that in a pre regular expression world that won't involve you know, even in a regular expression world that won't involve scanning at some point so this isn't the type of thing that you would put in every query and frankly the the class of developers who really understands regular expressions, um, there's not a whole lot of people in that set. So I, I don't know how much abuse of this you're going to get compared to the people who put like percent whatever percent in their queries and then ask why is this thing slow. Uh, if you can't look for patterns in large data with this thing, why? what do you even need it for? I didn't say you can't look at them. I'm saying you're going to scan either way. And that's that's the point is, tell me how to but do it today like without a scan. You scan forever, Kevin. It's yeah, a big table. Yeah. Sure, but tell me how to do it without scanning. Is there a way today? Well, my point is just that you're never going to get done. So it might as well, I, I don't know if having a bad way and having a way, I don't know. So if you, you have a, a big table that's messed up with a lot of data patterns. This thing is going to keep churning forever. And that for some definition of big and some definition of forever, I'll, I'll agree with you, but mm -hmm. Uh, I can scan through tens of millions of rows with string data, with textual data in what, a few seconds in, with NVMe, maybe not even that long. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, if, if we were talking about like one 5,400 RPM spinning disc and having to scan mm -hmm. a billion rows, then yeah, I fully agree with you. That, that sounds like an awful proposition, but um, we're not really talking about that, or or if we're talking about like low end Azure storage that's still on spinning disk or or cheap SSD, or somebody's uh, hand me down sand from from a garage sale, then yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't want to do a lot of scanning of large data sets and large large strings on there. Uh, but mm -hmm. if if we're saying that SQL Server can't handle scanning a million rows of varchar 20. Mm -hmm. Then what is the point of having a database to begin with at that point? I mean, that's that's varchar that, 20. That's true. More, 20 more size, yeah. And so, OK, we say, well, 100 million rows of varchar 20. All right. I mean, that's still what, two gigabytes? Um, if I'm in this, this might be one tiny step above putting XML in the database. You, you where's Solomon when I need him to argue? <laughs> but speaking of Solomon, let me do, let me point out something that, you know, this has actually been available to us in SQL, in Solomon SQL Sharp. So if you're not familiar, Solomon Rutsky is a member of our community. Um, catch him around in, in these places and he has a free version and a paid version of his SQL Sharp library, which is a CLR library that provides a lot of functionality, including, as I scroll down a bit, there is a set of functions for regular expression operations. So you could do this today, 
This essentially shells out to C-sharp and performs the regular expression operation on the uh, data to begin with. There are a couple variants of things like capture group, capture group, capture, and uh, versions that are for max size and versions that are for 4K size. So who has tiny tables like that anymore? I can see my devs using this to try to find patterns in some of my three terabyte tables in the XML. Are they certain? Oh, no. I, no. I didn't know that you were on poverty tier discs, Anders. Um, okay, tables. Yes, tables do grow, but how many places are you going that have 10 billion row tables where you would perform these operations? With specific emphasis on where you would perform these operations, because in a lot of cases, the 10 billion row table is a fact table for a warehouse that should be numeric data, it shouldn't have a bunch of string data to begin with. Uh, for transactional systems, some of those tables can get big, yes. Uh, some of the tables could be diagnostic where people do wanna perform regular expressions and those, depending on how big it is, yeah, it could be slow, it's a scan. But again, they're performing the same, they're performing the same work already, they're just doing it with cruder tools of char index, pad index, substring, and like statements. That might be true. And so I don't expect performance to be better. What I do expect is operations to be finer and for the experience to be better for a person writing this kind of a query. Um, and you know what? As a DBA, you could even say, you must be this tall to write a regular expression. <laughs> that's perfectly reasonable in an environment um if there are considerations about that but then you should probably also have you must be this tall to use a like operator because either way uh you can run the risk of blowing out performance the difference is that with a correct regular expression you're more likely to get the answer or answers that you want versus trying to hack together something using uh, tools that really weren't great for the job. And that's, that's where I'm at at the end of the day is, yeah, this is not going to be faster than the alternative. It's, it's probably, I don't know for sure because I, don't, I haven't seen uh, execution plans of regular expression operations, but most likely, it's not going to be any faster than the alternative. It's not going to be any faster than performing a scan of all of your data. What it is likely to be, however, is uh, a better long-term solution for situations where you need to search for certain patterns within your data. And uh, considering that in my day-to-day -day work, I'm using regular expressions on at least a weekly basis. Yes, and I would trust Solomon to implement this more than Microsoft. That's a reasonable point. Solomon does a pretty good job of this stuff. Um, so I can say open with an open mind here that it is entirely possible that the performance may suffer. Uh, my expectation would be that it wouldn't be any different. I think it would still just be index scan and then uh, compute scalar operation. But yeah, I suppose we'll see. I, I could uh, possibly see some gnarly regular expression that requires a good amount of compute where you're searching back in the string and then trying to search forward in the string. And those can get expensive. Um, assuming that that those operations are even uh, supported when the time comes. Regardless, I'm happy for it. Mala and Anders can have pitchforks and, and torches and uh, go go rile up the, uh, the villagers, um, and that's okay. But amen with Solomon. Yeah, yeah, no, Solomon does a great job of, of developing this stuff out. Um, there's been a lot in SQL Sharp over the years that I've enjoyed, and that was even before 
coming down here to the triangle and, and getting to know him personally. Um, I was shilling for him before I even knew him. All right. Last topic for the night. Another topic that Anders is going to love. This, this is the uh, Make Anders Happy edition of Shop Talk. Uh, Mike, you wanted to talk for the past like month and a half or so about Azure Data Studio and some of the things you enjoy about it. Yes. Oh, so, I, love, I love Azure Data Studio. Big fan. Uh-oh. Anders, you've, you've lost uh, one of your supporters here. <laughs> it's almost like uh -huh. we, have, we have different opinions on different things, and that's okay. <laughs> But that's because I write T SQL all day and Anders doesn't. And so I, I get it. You know, yeah. That's okay. For sure. If everything's working well, Sanders just reads books at his desk. Isn't that what he says? <laughs> uh, right. That is the I'm best part of being a DBA. Um, so, yeah. So the, I've been using it a lot. And again, I think some of these things might be possible with either out of the box. Um, um, management Studio or um, SSMS. Um, so some of the reasons I like it, um, I think the IntelliSense is really good. Um, the SQL developer coming from the Oracle world, it, for whatever reason, the IntelliSense stinks. Um, and the IntelliSense, I think, is really, really good and I think better than my SSMS experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of shortcuts and I think some of those could be coming from you know the Visual Studio code. Mm -hmm. but, um, I hold, <clears throat> I move lines a lot. So I use alt down. Mm -hmm. um, so you can move lines very quickly. Um, I kind of in the past have like cut and pasted lines, which is bonkers. Now that now that there's a better way, it seems bonkers to do that. Um, you can also copy lines down. So one of the things that we were talking about is like like statements. So if you have to do bunch of like statements and this thing like, then the, you know you can just do alt shift down and it just copies down a bunch of them. Uh, so you can do that. Actually, I prefer the SSMS shortcut alt shift down because that. that's where you can do vertical selection. Um, you can do vertical, you can do vertical selection in this too. With the mouse. I, yes, but yeah, exactly. You, you drag it to activate it. Yeah, so. that's... Um, I like the connection pane setup uh, better than SSMS. So the connection panes to me, you can group things pretty easily and you can have, you know, a lot of multiple connections. And then if you're in a query, you can connect and then reconnect or disconnect. Um, and cause I'm doing that a lot and it, I don't know why, but for SSMS, maybe I'm doing it wrong or I, I don't have any add-ons, but it's kind of like, I connect to one and then I have to connect to another and I don't really have like multiple connections set up. Um, you can also search for objects pretty easily. So they have a, a good object search. So if you're searching for a specific column or what have you. We did talk about shot top in the past about extensions from VS code. So that's pretty neat. So hmm. you explained this while that it's really under the hood. It's, it's visual studio code. Yep. Um, so I, I went back to that demonstration of Rainbow CSV and I added Rainbow CSV to mine and it was pretty easy to do for someone like me, which is a miracle. Mm -hmm. um, it's cross platform, right? Which is kind of nice. So, um, you know, you have that ability to use it in different environments. Um, and then I like the folder view. Um, and that's probably something that like I'm using yeah. Google editors. I don't, I'm not, is familiar with that. I know a lot of developers use VS Code and, and um, Visual Studio and Microsoft, and it has a lot of that uh, folder stuff, but I like that. And then another, there's like a little thing that I like uh, just based on the way it works sometimes. Of course, you can right click on queries and say select top 1000, et cetera, and that works pretty well. But you can also, um, there's a thing where you can press the Alt Space button next to select star, and it will fill in all the columns for you automatically and that I use that. I don't use it all the time, but when I do use it, um, it's very helpful um, and saves me a bunch of time. So yeah, so those are some of the top features in me and I'm using it more and more and. Um, what I love to make is the auto save. I don't have to worry about, I like, you know, I like the fact that SSMS brings my stuff back if I go out, you know, unexpectedly and, you know, I give that, but still, I really like my changes saved as I work. I don't have to bother about, 
you know, clicking anywhere or doing anything for that. I really like that. That's excellent too. And then um, right. the, the notebook functionality is cool. I don't right. use it fully, but um, I could do that. And I know my, Microsoft uses them a lot. Um, they, they talk about it constantly. Yes. Um, and then I like to, in the, in the plans and the estimates, it gives you like a little summary of like, what are the worst? It gives you a different view of the, the kind of pain points a little bit more quickly. It's got like a, a summary. I got to open my door. Hello. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So that's my, I, I actually end up using it more than SSMS. And Deep Beaver has been something that I've talked about in the past that I that I liked, but I've been having an issue. I've been having some issues with it here and there. Like the same exact SQL will run in Azure Data Studio, but it won't run on Deep Beaver for some reason. It'll give me an error, and I have no idea why it won't run it. So I I've kind of moved away from it a little bit, even though it's nice because it's multi dialect. It's like right. I'm begging, I'm like, why is it not running this? And it might have to do with like an ASCII setting or UTF-8, you know, I have no idea why it's not working, but it's something something like that or something to do with the Java um, uh, infrastructure underneath the hood. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say there's, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of Azure Data Studio. I am also happy that SSMS 20 is coming out, that Aaron Stilato has posted about SSMS is not going away. There's still active development on it and uh, they are actively working on making both of the products better because they do serve different audiences and uh, it is good to have both of them, I think. Yeah, I I like the formatting, um, the ability to format code and the color options also with Azure Data Studio. With, you know, it's easy on my eyes and it makes formatting so much easier. Sure. So, all right, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to say once again, thank you, Bart, for coming in and talking so to much. us about what you've got. Uh, time to split it up. Enterprise Manager for Managing VS Code for Development. Are, are you sure you don't want to rename that to Query Analyzer, Anders? Um, every, everything old is new again. I, I see where you're going. So, yes, once again, thank you. And we're going to wrap things up. Remember, tomorrow we have Rick Pack, who is going to talk to us about some of the work that he has been doing lately. That's our Data Science and Business Intelligence Meetup. And until we see each other in a future edition of Shop Talk or wherever, everyone, take care. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.